poles, but would have a back because the soldiers who had chest wounds had difficulty breathing. Mm -hmm. And since they had no beds or anything fancy to prop them up, and they were going to be on this litter, amazingly, for only 90 minutes. 90 minutes later, they were back in England to a general hospital, which was wonderful. But I had made, for instance, nobody gave me this job, but it grew out of the need, uh, a back, a backrest that could be put behind each wounded soldier with a chest wound, so he was propped up three quarters or so that he breathed a little more easily. That stayed with the litter and with him on the airplane and back to Normandy. So those were the kinds of things I was doing for those three months. These were very important campaigns until we finally broke out. And in fact, it was just a few days later that Paris got liberated. I was put into a car. I was transferred to another unit to a medical battalion. I went to a general hospital as assistant detachment commander. My duties now became entirely different. And we were in a sealed car, and we went through France and into Germany. And we were there simply because someone had discovered that a large... You want me to keep going? Is this what you want? <laughs> someone had discovered a large German hospital in Aachen. Aachen is near the border of Belgium. And it's before Cologne. And it's before the famous Remagen Bridge was taken. And the reason we were going there was that this hospital had been vacated by the Germans. Now another thing you should understand, in the medical department, to service the hospitals, the larger hospitals that were built toward the rear, they would appeal to a hospital in the United States to send a full crew of doctors and nurses, and sometimes other personnel, but mostly doctors and nurses. We were where we shouldn't be. We were in Aachen before, nearby Cologne had taken. There were big battles to be taken up there. And of course, subsequently, there were some more big battles below. So once again, <clears throat> my duties were to share together with one other captain. We lived separately, and our responsibility was about supervising and being responsible for 500 enlisted men. There were also 500 nurses and doctors, but the enlisted men did all the work that is required to keep a hospital going and to be of some help and assistance. We also had German prisoners being taken all the time. So I was given a wide variety of jobs from being rehabilitation officer to athletic officer. I also was taking care of German prisoners, keeping them busy, cleaning out the swimming pool, which never used or anything of that nature. So my duties changed somewhat. Financial officer, all these titles are given you because these are activities that must be taken care of when there is a unit of soldiers who are being paid regularly and who are being supervised regularly and who are being led by officers of one kind or another. I was now, you must understand, <clears throat> in the medical department, there is the medical corps, that's the doctors, there's the nursing corps, that's the nurses, and there's the medical administrative corps. That's what I was in, the medical administrative corps. So my responsibilities had to do with the soldiers who were not officers, but who were by far the major number of soldiers in the medical department. Okay. Um, I also am familiar with the fact that you took photographs during the war. Indeed. You did that while you were part of the medical administration corps? This has nothing to do with my responsibilities. Yeah. I uh, picked up somewhere, I'm sorry, I can't remember, a little $15 camera that was mess made for a few years, Nansko Speedex. And uh, I was familiar with some of the finer pictures being produced in the United States. And I like taking pictures. So I was taking pictures. 
And I asked all my friends and family back home not to send me socks and cookies and things of that nature. I said, but please send me rolls of film because everything's not open or anything like that where we were. So I was receiving lots of film and it was inappropriate. Actually, it was not quite possible and not quite decent to take pictures of the, the wounded soldiers or the dead soldiers. That was too much of the job which occupied one thoroughly. I was dealing with that all the time. But I was able <clears throat> to have access to a jeep and as the armies moved up toward Cherbourg, freeing these little villages and farms onto Cherbourg, I used to go out after them. And I was interested in the people. So I took pictures of the men, the women, and the children. And eventually, and always, if I saw something pretty, because I enjoyed being in Europe, I had always wanted to travel. So I took pictures in that fourth category. It turns out that's what happened. I also took lots of pictures of the, the staff, my colleagues, in the hospital. And to get them developed, which is very important, uh, because you don't want to leave them in the role. Uh, I had to find people who owned the little tobacco shops in France, in the small villages, small towns. When you see a tobacco sign, it's where they sell cigarettes and tobacco, newspapers maybe a bit. They also sell Kodak things. They were closed and they were, everything was gray. Of course, nothing was going on. There were very few people left who had not been able to flee when the fighting and the guns and the bombs started. Um, but I, sp I spoke some French. That helped a lot. So I <clears throat> would meet adults and children and I would talk with them. And uh, taking lots of their pictures. Lots of nice things happened because of that. I can tell you stories galore about the different people I met and what their problems were, and the stories behind the pictures. So those pictures, of course, I had negatives of. They were accumulating. When we drew back from Germany eventually, I was in a little town in Belgium, and I was quartered, myself and, and a few other soldiers, in an uh, industrial high school. No students, no faculty. I was living in the, uh, the principal's office. My cot was in the principal's office kind of thing. So I met the principal eventually. He invited me to his house one night. And I explained to him <clears throat> that I was busy dragging these negatives all over Europe with me. And that was no good for them. He says, wait, I'll talk to the, uh, the uh, faculty man who was in charge of... Uh, woodworking. And I met that gentleman and I explained to him my problem. I had these little two and a quarter square negatives which were jammed up and bulking. He said, I'll make you some boxes. He made me three beautiful little boxes with tongue and groove, no nails, no screws, with a sliding top. It was very snug. And I cut little squares of cardboard and I put them between each negatives to protect the negative. And those I was able to manage to get back to the United States. And for the last 35 years, they were in an attic. We were down here about five years. We lived up in Riparius. Mm -hmm. In the attic, and I didn't do very much with them or anything at all. In the freezing cold, because we used to get down to Florida sometimes in the hot summer. An interesting story. I don't know how much of it is important to you. But while down in Florida, I got interested in watercolors. And uh, one day I was trying to see what I could do working from a photograph, one of the photographs from these, these days in Europe. And the head of the, the Museum of Art, the, the class was in the Coral Springs Art Museum, came by to look in on the classes and everything else. She said, she said, that's very interesting. She says, you have any more like that? I thought she was kidding. I thought she said she was going to show my watercolors, which are not that good, they're Sunday painting watercolors. She says, no, I'm interested in the pictures that we're talking about. So I said, oh, they're back home up in the Adirondacks. 
She says, well, I'd like to see, send me some proofs, little pictures, you know. <clears throat> of course, I'm very interested. When I got back here at the end of the winter, your winter up here, <laughs> I dug out a hundred of them. And I had those hundred made just the same size, little, you, put, you can put 20 or 30 on a sheet of paper, and they're little pictures, kind of thing. And I sent them down to her in Florida. And she says, I, I have chosen 50 of them, and I'd like to make an exhibit show in the, in the museum. I was very flattered and very excited, but I had the responsibility then of blowing those 50 pictures up, framing them for presentation, and getting ready for a show, <clears throat> which she then did. It was very successful. In fact, she extended it an extra three months or so. And that was the first time the show was shown. It was shown three times again after that. <clears throat> and what I'm going to give you is a copy of the catalog. Did, did Mr. Roselle show you that at all? Um, you don't recall? Um, okay. Let me show it to you. And you can take it. You'll find that this, some of them, although as they typically do in these catalog things, there are many of the pictures, the main pictures. There's an example of all four categories. And then at the end, <clears throat> there are pictures to show what was in the show but are not enlarged for here. And incidentally, if you'll read this, there's something about me and my experience, and there's something about the photographs. So go ahead. That's what you said you knew I did, and there you'll have that. Um, okay, getting back to the war. Um, what was going through your mind while everything was going on? Do you know how many years ago this was here? You can't remember. <laughs> I can't remember what was going through my mind, but question is a good one, and the answer is an interesting one. The actuality, first of all, of being in a service where you are not doing what you were planning to do, like go to school or go to work, mm -hmm. but I'm now in an army, and I know it's a war, and I may be assigned anywhere. I also have everything taken care of. I have a place to sleep, and I have something to eat kind of thing. <clears throat> the great bulk of, of people in the army, as I was at the beginning, are nowhere near the guns and the bombs. But it makes no difference, it seems to me. I can answer your question because I can recall vividly how different I felt by virtue of being in uniform and in this war. There's a, an interesting change of of concern about things. You don't have the usual responsibilities or the usual concerns about tomorrow or yesterday, so to speak. It's a sort of suspended animation. You're in a kind of uh, stasis is a good word, but it's not quite right. You, you, you don't have the usual responsibilities. You're freer in many, many respects so that there is a, an intensifying of the impressions you have. The people I took pictures of 50 years ago, 55 years ago, I remember as of, as of yesterday. I talked with them. Sometimes the kids took me home. I gave one lady my laundry to do. I talked to a little boy in French, and he said to me, the kids said, cigarette pour papa. And I said, no, c'est défendu de fumer. In French, I said, no, it's forbidden. Immediately he said, chocolat. He jumped to chocolate. Uh, very bright little kid. You'll see there's a picture of him. Um, these things are part and parcel of the experience. You have not the usual responsibilities, nor the usual concerns. You have a larger concern and responsibility. But it's not immediate. You know that's only if you move forward. It's only when you get near the infantry where 90% of the injuries occur 
75%, sometimes in Normandy it was 90% kind of thing. So I can't tell you what was going through my mind except to tell you that in one sense I was very much alive and enjoying, in quotes, myself, despite the fact that I didn't choose to be there myself, mm -hmm. kind of thing. Things are very, very vivid. For the next many years, I tried to find out where that little field was that I had lived in. I started out living in a foxhole. And a couple of days later, we moved to small little tents, four officers in a tent. But the anti-aircraft guns all around us were shooting what are called very large anti-aircraft missiles, 88s and things of that nature, which would go up to near the airplane, then they would burst, hopefully injuring a German airplane. And then the pieces, the jagged pieces of steel, which were red hot and big and sharp, came hurtling down. And they came right through the tent. They would tear a tent to pieces. So while we were out of the foxhole, which were just, we were two-man foxholes, it's very interesting, you dig down a little ways and there's a shelf to sleep on, but you're still below the level of the ground. And then there's a piece, place where you can stand, deeper, in the center, two men. We weren't in there for very long, a week or less. So we moved to these little tents with cots, but these pieces of metal were still falling. So we rigged up four poles at the four corners of the cot, and then put those pierced plankings I mentioned before on top overlapping so the holes were covered. Mm -hmm. So that if something came through the tent, it would come through the canvas and bounce off the metal. Uh, very, very vivid. I recall things like that, of course. But I was very interested to try to find out where it was that all of this took place, that I was so busy. You want to keep in mind that when you're in the middle of a war activity, you may know what's happening around you, but you have no picture idea of what's going on anywhere else. Nobody does. You cannot. It's never according to the book. So for years, as we go back for entertainment, for amusement, for traveling, I go with my wife. We looked for many, many years. We liked France a lot. We covered it completely on our own as well as in the army. We would look for it. We'd go up to Normandy and never could fight quite pinpoint it. Until there was one trip run by Elder Hostel, which is an outfit that started essentially for college people. You have to be over 55. And it combined travel with education. So they had more elaborate, they still do, more elaborate lectures. And they spend more time giving you some of the details about the world in which you're traveling. We saw the announcement that they had a group going to the Normandy beaches. So we joined it and discovered, to our pleasant pleasure, the, the man who was running it, the local man, had been in the French resistance. I was in the group, a group of about 30 of us, the only soldier. I, we told him what the problem was. I had never been able to find where I had d done my initial work in Normandy. So when we got up to saint mer eglise area, he says, come with me. He introduced us to the curator, the director of a local army museum up there, and explained, I explained to him, that I was with a unit that put people on the first airplanes coming into France. He says, I know exactly where you were for the first time we had that. And he took us to the spot. And finally, after all these years of searching, I found the field in which I had been. I couldn't recognize it, of course. It had grown up. It was green again. Uh, it was just another field. And it was completely divorced from everything else I remembered. But uh, that's part of the, the answer to your question is many of these things are vivid. And what goes through your mind is determined essentially by what you're doing, by what you're experiencing. And also your personal response to being in a strange place. I'd always wanted to travel, to see Paris. Everybody wanted to go to Paris. I went through Paris the first time, sealed in a, in a boxcar. I couldn't get out. But I got back there during the war. That's another story entirely. Fascinating. <laughs> and I loved it. I remember everything I did. Oh, 
for 10 days in Paris, completely on my own. Uh, well, I met another soldier and we shared the digs and stuff like that. But everything is vivid, everything is, is firm and strong. And uh, I enjoyed seeing the backwoods, the scenery, you'll see scenic shots, or you'll see the belts doing different things. Some of these pictures, many of them have been compared very flatteringly to me, to other famous photographers' pictures. So that's why it keeps getting shown, kind of thing. Okay, I'll talk about that later. If it's all about the pictures, uh, since I also, through the years, read a little bit afterwards, of course, about photography. And I quote different famous people who have written about photography. And as you glance at these, you'll find out the kind of pictures I take and why I take them. In other words, what I like about certain pictures, which I find more attractive than any others, kind of thing. Essentially, the word is humanistic. Uh, well, you'll read about it if you're interested. I will. Um, okay. Um, let's see. Um, how was the food for you? Was it like, did you get more than like what the soldiers were getting? Sorry, tell me again. Okay. For the food, did food? you? Yeah. Did, was, we, did we get different food? Yeah. No. No. Oh no. That was no. all the same for everybody. Everything was the same. At least at my end, I can't recall whether or not the mess hall for the soldiers and the nurses in the hospital were any different. But in the main, it could have been, because we, we the captain and, and myself, were more surrounded by and concerned with uh, hundreds of soldiers. We ate in that mess hall. But for most of the units, throughout all the others that I described to you, from the very front where the soldiers are fighting on back as they move back. Have you ever seen the MASH pictures on TV? MASH? A series of very successful, they still run them, they run them like mad. They're 20 years old now. Uh, typical. Officers, officers enlisted men were the same. Get in line with a tray, you go down the list and the, uh, the cookies, the cooks, put on your dish whatever you want. And again, the, the way Things were, you, you, you ate off metal, a metal container. You had two barrels, you dip it into hot soapy water and then to hot clean water and let it air dry. So there was no dishwashing and drying or infecting that way. And I think that was universal. It was the same meal everywhere. Um, how did you feel about the enemy during the war? Did you have any I was happy to be in the army because of the enemy. And that was the, the real, first real enemy we faced in Amer as Americans outside of the revolution, of course, which was something that was necessary and was wonderful. The Civil War, which was terrible, we were fighting each other. So that was no enemy. Thereafter, every war was unjustifiable as far as I'm concerned. This war was justified. We were fighting a menace. A menace that was terrible, that had revealed itself in Spain a year or so before, and revealed itself as it was moving all the way across from Poland and Czechoslovakia and into Russia, and so on and so on, and killing people for no reason other than what they were, whether they were invalids or, or what do we call it, and certainly if they were Jewish, and they just killed people. It's unbelievable. It was the, the most horrible thing that has ever happened, as far as I'm concerned, in civilization. So how I felt about the enemy was quite bitter. I dealt with many of the soldiers directly, <clears throat> not necessarily feeling that same bitterness. Uh, the war was over for them, so to speak. We met many, uh, in fact, there are pictures of Russians who had been pressed into service and were being released. And of course, I talked to many of the French people, <clears throat> and the German people too, and the Dutch people, the Belgian people. Uh, so the answer is, uh, 
that's how I felt the, about the enemy. I don't recall any strong opportunity to have feelings directly about mm -hmm. particular soldiers. There's a picture of three soldiers cleaning ovens. People often ask, what kind of ovens are they cleaning? And are they really, are they German or what? And I had to explain to them that uh, this was a set of onions, ovens working off propane and they get kind of greasy. And if it weren't the German soldiers, we would be cleaning them. Mm -hmm. So this was something for them to do, it was very useful. <laughs> so I had put three German soldiers cleaning them. But it, I don't recall any f personal feelings whatsoever. Mm. Kind of thing. Okay. Um, so, where were you when the war ended? Oh, I was in, uh, we had pulled back into Germany. We were in the edge, the buzz bombs were falling, fell on me. Um, back further into Moreland Wells. Jeez, I don't really know whether I started the, when, when, you, when you reach a certain number of points individually, mm -hmm. and you get the points on the basis of the battles you've been in, and the Purple Heart you have, you get five points for this, and five points for that stuff. When you reach a certain level, you individually are eligible to go back. So that it's not that the whole unit breaks up. The war is over by now. Uh, so that individuals, when my turn came, I think I left from somewhere in Belgium, or just on the other side from Germany. And then I had to make a couple of stops on my way back. In fact, I had to cross over from France to England to get on the Queen Mary of all ships to come back into New York Harbor. There are pictures of some of that too. Going over was interesting too. We had a zigzag to avoid submarines. We had 5,000 soldiers going to Europe who should have been on a ship that took no more than 2,000. So we had two meals a day and to prepare for lunch we made ourselves uh, hot, I mean uh, chocolate sandwiches. Chocolate bar sandwiches. We took a roll and a, a, a bar of chocolate, and that way we got lunch. We also got coming back on the Queen Mary is the same thing. Going over was another interesting story. The only place where there was a difference. It was a strange experience. Thank you. I don't know if you want the time, time to take it, but yeah. <laughs> the ship that went from England, carrying me and a bunch of soldiers, to uh, and part of my unit to uh, France, to, to D-Day, we landed on Omaha Beach, it was a ship that they had pressed into service to do this, and it had been a luxury kind of a liner from England to India. And the rich people in England used to ride on this ship, and of course they were very well treated. We're on this trip, halfway across the English Channel, there were about 20 officers and we were sitting on the upper deck and we had diff maybe different meals, I don't really know, but we were sitting quite comfortably around an oval table and behind every one or two of us was an Indian wearing uh, an Indian turban and dressed as an Indian getting served. And down below uh, were the all the other soldiers. I don't know what the hell happened. Yeah, everything happened too fast because suddenly we, we were not on the ship overnight. The ship stopped and we had our orders was to climb over the edge and down the rope ladders on the side of the ship carrying only what you could carry. We only had what we had on our backs, which was a great coat and your own personal gear and some first aid stuff and into these landing craft. So we were standing jammed in the landing craft that come up on the beaches, down goes the platform, and then you go onto the beach. That's another story. So that's the only place <laughs> where I remember officers had different meals <laughs> from, the, from the average soldier. What, what made you, what, what made me recall that? I don't recall. How was it going home? Where were you when you left? I don't hear you, friend. That's the question again for you. Um, what was that? She asked. What, what, what started him on this, on this trip? Ask what the question. 
But the original question. The question was, was asked. Was where was where you were you? Where ended? were you in Europe? When oh, you, when oh, where was I in Europe? Oh. I don't know. I came. I guess we came, landed in in Liverpool, and then we jeeped and bus and truck down to the uh, departure. Well, this is at the end of the war. Please, friend. I'm sorry. Um, did you get any awards or medals or honors? Well, I got, I got the necessary medals for the four campaigns that were recognized, and I have a Purple Heart, so that helped with the points. Just, I just described to you what I was doing in different geographical areas. Mm -hmm. Because of the intensity of the fight in each instance, based on the amount of resistance, from the Germans, and the fact that there was some space between each of these local endeavors, uh, they gave them different names, so that they have different battles, if that's how these things that they get battle names, like the Battle of the Bulge, or uh, the Battle of, uh, of the Remagen Bridge, or uh, the Battle for Cherbourg, the Battle for San Lo, and so on. Whatever, I don't remember what the names were. Okay. Um, do you believe that the war changed you into the person that you are today? Do you think the it war happened? has changed? I don't know that. I don't know how I can answer that. No, I suspect that I felt pretty keenly about the evils of fascism before I went, and I certainly don't feel any less concern today. In fact, I feel more concerned given what takes place all around here well, every once in a while as an indication of lack of, of concern for the maintaining of our liberties as, as, as it as should be for what America stands for. I'm very conscious of that. Okay. Um, well, thank you for coming today. You're not interested eventually in becoming a, a Porter of any kind, are you? That's not your. Do you know what you? Do you have an interest yet? Oh, I'm not sure yet. Are you going to college somewhere? Yeah. Um. I applied to a few. Uh -huh.